Welcome to Conversations with the Authors. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Conversations with the Authors. I'm your host, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Daryl. <laughs> I, I forgot my name. I'm your host, Daniel. <laughs> I'm, I'm Daryl. And I'm Sandra. Um, and if you're listening to this uh, podcast, dear listeners and readers, you know by now that this is an unscripted podcast. So all that you're hearing is authentic and, uh, you know, uh, well, not scripted. If you hear babies in the background, that means it's a Monday and it's nap time. So uh, <laughs> please enjoy anyway. Now, before I get started, I want to mention uh, we started this podcast now ten episodes in, and I was start I was asked um, prior to starting, or well, sort of in the middle, I guess, of starting this, has doing this podcast with your parents, my parents, um, uh, affected our relationship? Uh, and before I answer that question, <laughs> I want to give a thanks to Alexander Nakarada for his. Uh, composition of our intro uh, because uh, it, it, it really gets me going every time we hear it. Uh, uh, so my answer to the question is, uh, I think so. I think, yes, it has brought me closer because uh, I can ask my parents things that as a younger child, uh, being around whether developing the story, I didn't have the chance to really ask or really critically think about and it has affected my ability to write in a positive manner, but also I think critically think about things that I'm creating. Um, and now that I've been asked that question, I, I suppose I want to extend that question to you, mom and dad, Daryl, Sandra. Has Do you feel that this podcast has benefited our relationship as a family? I, I think so, uh, because uh, uh, in the normal course of events, you, when you're talking to your child, your, your child responds to you, whether they're adult or children, as you're the parent, you know. And sometimes sometimes you wish for a, a bit more more friendliness and, and less of whatever you say is fine and that's what I'll do. I, I want to have your true opinion mm -hmm. about things and see how you feel about things. And... I want you to express your humor without reserve. So right, yeah, uh huh, yeah, ma. I think it has. It, it's it's been good for all of us. It's, and one thing that it's made us more proud of you mm. because it showed that all the schooling that we put you through and all the conversations we've had, you have actually learned what we sent you to school for. Mm -hmm. And now, you, now I didn't you, waste your money. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, no, I didn't think you would. But now you're not afraid to use that with us, right? You're not, you're as bold with me now as I used to be when you guys were little. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we needed for this, right? Right, right. <laughs> Which it could be a benefit or a detriment, I guess, depending on what I ask. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sure it's fine. Um, so, let. So I want to start with some questions we got from our our readers. Um, first of all, how does and this is from Josh, who's a sci-fi writer. He wants to know how do you balance the scientific accuracy in your sorry, storytelling? Did you say that again? I said. I'm sorry. How do you balance <laughs> a scientific accuracy in your storytelling? I feel okay. like you need to listen more, Siri, because you're you're not. This is twice now. Okay. All right. Well, scientific accuracy, uh, we want to have enough so that you can really attach to it and that uh, it attaches to your, your, your sense of uh, what can actually happen, mm -hmm. in fact. And then, uh, but in a science fiction story, we have the liberty to bend it mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. And so it fits, but it's kind of, we can bend it. Right. You know, in fantasy or in science fiction, we can bend it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that too. It, I like that everything is based in science, but like the medical conferences that we have with when when we go to the conferences and I ask the doctors a question, and they all the panel all looks at itself and and my what if question is uh, we haven't asked that question yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right, 
I like to ask the question that wasn't asked and then expand upon it with your dad so that it, we can take it where people haven't thought of yet. And, and science fiction writer, sci-fi writer, Josh, I want to thank you for asking that question because it allows me to ask this question. We mention a lot in the books about detail, and you talk about these different sort of uh, areas, locales that we're in and with great description. Uh, and there are some that sort of require you to be uh, focused on your research and how your research dictates a place should look. But then when you come down to something like the Wizard's Tower, you know, you've got, you talk about stacks of books being everywhere and you mention there being only a, a foot's distance between, you know, his walking path. And uh, my question is now, how do you, in, what inspires you when you don't, when you're not bound to the rules of science fiction and reality, when you can really be creative about creating, you know, or about developing a, a fantasy location? The fun part is free associating. Mm -hmm. If I, if I look at something and I say, what if, then I can take that. If I look at a pile of crackers and I say, hmm, what if they just decide to turn themselves into crumbs and make a tornado and clean up all the files in here and all of a sudden they're, they're exactly alphabetized and I know exactly how to find them. That would be fantastic. I think we should have a chimp on this show. <laughs> you know, I remember uh, the, the Today Show when I was a kid, and they had a chimp on it. Uh, I can't even remember the thing's name. You know, but uh, we kids wanted to watch it just because it had a chimp. I think the series got to be my chimp. Right, right, <laughs> okay. right. Uh, Don't say anything. All right. Go. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, so what about you, Dad, when it comes to being able to de create a locale just based off of fantasy and imagination alone. What inspires you? How do you get into that? I'm going to craft this space. Well, I just uh, kind of let my, I cut my imagination free so that I can think about things. I think of places I've seen, things that I've, uh, uh, places I've gone to before. And I, it may be an amalgam of those things or maybe something totally just crafted straight out of my dreams. You know, so, uh, when you when you're writing fantasy, you have a lot of leeway mm, to yes, play. Yes, a lot of leeway. A lot of times too, we're driving in the car through the through the forest preserves, and we'll just say, "Hey, what if it did this?" Or, "You see that? What what, what can we do with that?" I mean, Josh also wants to know, uh, what uh, do you? I'm sorry. He also wants to know. Uh, which sci-fi authors or works have influenced you the most? Well, I, I think for me, uh, starting out many years ago, you know, I used to write even when I was in elementary school, um, and I, I really dug Rod Serling, you know, mm -hmm. who did the Twilight mm -hmm. Zone, and that was my big thing. I used to try to write stories like him, mm -hmm. you know, and that was my, probably my youngest influence. I right. think. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Rod Serling was one of my favorites, and Isaac Asimov, mm. who manipulated time and asked questions about time. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Mm -hmm. definitely. Arthur C. Clarke mm -hmm. is another one. Right. If anybody remembers uh, Space Odyssey 2000, uh, 2001, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he was the author of that and many other things. And uh, I, I think those are all wonderful uh, pools uh, to draw inspiration from. Mm -hmm. um, Danielle Pere uh, Daniela Perez... Uh, wants to know, what do you hope readers will take away from your science fiction books? Well, I, I, I think she, they should take away of a, a, a sense of wonder. Yeah, I want to have uh, that out there. And I, I think, especially if you want, are a future writer, uh, you can wonder and imagine things. And you can say, what if? And it's the what if sometimes that that gives you ideas for stories and things. Take that away, you know, and take that away with you. Let that be the the prize. Uh, and uh, I I think it'll take you far. Uh, yeah, 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 Sandy. I th I want it to be like what I took away from my grandpa and my and my my uncle Barney. Mm. They said everything is a tool. Everything is right. a tool. Yeah. 
what if you don't use it for what the tool is is supposed to be used for? Right, right. And I remember one day, <clears throat> my my grandfather gave me a fork and told me to dig out at the trunk of a tree. Oh, oh dear. How did you even manage to... Did you get it out? Did you... I got it out by asking my father for some explosives. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> and I All dug right. a little hole. Yeah, they got the little tree stump the remover there just to use the there. fork to uh, hold it in place. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> how do you balance as authors your individual writing styles and the ideas uh, while you're collaborating in a single book? You know, I think having different writing styles is an advantage because we get to meld them together. Mm -hmm. And so you don't always get a, a story that has a certain bent or a certain lean, but we can move in different directions. Uh, I pull one way, she pulls the other way, and then sometimes we pull together. Uh, so we do have different styles. But I, I think when we mix them together, we get something that's different. We get a third thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so a lot of our, our readers, some of them are writers, and they're writing um, inevitably romantic scenes, love scenes, what have you. Um, so how can an author approach writing a scene of intimacy and love? And what techniques do you use when you make them authentic? Well, I, I think that that can take many dimensions. You know, you can take someone, uh, memories and thoughts and aspirations of what love might mean to them, and you can uh, give it to your character. Uh, he can be successful in love, or, or he or she can be successful in love, or they can not be successful in love. Either way, uh, you uh, use the most tender emotions that you have and you can also fashion it to, to, to fit your, the personality you'd like your character to have, whether, whether he's philosophical about it, he's humorous about it, or he's very morose you know, uh, uh, about it. You mm -hmm. know? So it depends on what you, what, uh, you want to have happen to move the story. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I also think it helps because if you have one partner who is more experienced and one partner who's less experienced, you can collaborate when you come on a character that needs to be more timid or a, a character that needs to be a little bit more all-knowing or yeah. aggressive. Mm -hmm. it, and it, yeah, go on. It, it, no, it, I was just going to say that it reminds me of when I was uh, in acting school when I was mm -hmm. a kid. And... Uh, uh, they ask us, so how would you? What would you do to cry on cue, or what right. would you do uh, to have a certain feeling or feeling of bereavement, or or our joy or happiness or love? And uh, we would use the method, you know. And and the, the method was like method acting is to think about something in your own life, right? You know, and see if you can take that emotion and and apply it uh, to that scene. Right, and 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 mm. and on the opposite side of romance, uh, it makes me wonder when writing scenes that have to do with violence and gore, and maybe not so tender, loving situations. How do you write the story without, I suppose, for lack of a better term, offending your your audience, your readers? How do you uh, how do you stave off being afraid of writing what you need to write to drive the story forward well i don't i don't know if you always want to not offend mm -hmm. because if it's a villain you may want to offend you may want them to be appalled as a matter mm -hmm. of fact because uh that's what you might need you know suppose your 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 villain is amoral right you know right. and has no uh uh no reservation about uh, doing bad things it's it's a little bit harder to write, you know, for most people because most people aren't bad, right. so they have to kind of suspend their uh, their 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 uh, morals temporar temporarily. They have to suspend their inhibitions temporarily, so they can get that down on uh, on paper and they can imbue their character mm -hmm. with uh, those those dastardly emotions and feelings that that you need uh, for that part right. of the story. Sandy, I agree with Daryl. 
Mm. Um, the violence that when I use it in in a in a book is observed. Of, right. You know, this is what happened to a relative, a, a friend, a, you know, a, a a fellow student, somebody that I saw in the street, mm. and I try to use the the anger and right. the and the disdain that it brought up in me to to say this is what I want to do about it. Right. And I think also too uh, you know, I have a lot of people present me with their writing sometimes and they ask me to review it and give me their to give their opinions on it and I think sometimes it's a matter of you know not um presenting scenes unwarranted, you know, being violent for the sake of being violent. Right. You know? Um, I think that's also uh, helpful to the scene. You know, you don't, you really don't want to produce anything that's just gratuitous, right? Just for that, absolutely, right. You, know. you, you don't want to be violent for the sake you of know. being violent. I think, uh, like you're saying, Dad, I think that it's, it's not unlike when you take a kindly, lovable character and you give them more reasons to love them. It sort of locks that in. This is a character we like and love and want to follow. Uh, in the same sense, it's taking an act that will, you know, okay, this guy kicked a dog. He's definitely a bad guy. We definitely don't like him. That's something, uh, I think it's a way of locking that motive in. Um, you know, and I, I think uh, when you're writing a, a, a violent scene that uh, it's got to, sometimes you want it to really mean something and something, sometimes you just want it to illustrate something. Right. When you illustrate right. something, you're showing how what your bad guy will uh, go, what lengths he'll go to to get what he wants. Right. When you want it to mean something, you might wind up taking a beloved character out. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and, to in, and how do authors ensure? Because uh, we're talking, uh, we're going to talk about taking characters out, or you know, things disappearing, things being found. It happens in stories. It's just part of the process. So, in terms of continuity, how do you ensure continuity in a fantasy world? And what steps do you take to avoid things like plot holes? Like, hey, that happened there, but why is all of a sudden you've got this Deus Ex Machina moment going on over here? Well, <laughs> you know what, the the. Uh... Deus ex machina is something you kind of want to avoid if possible. That's the old Greek way of um, introducing a god at the end of uh, uh, of a story to make things all right. right you know, yeah, just everything's to cure better things. Just, so that's, you know, because. We don't do that too much. In, <laughs> it sounds very comedic, you know, but that's what they used to do. Yeah. You know, and so if you can, sometimes things can happen and your, your character might give an explanation, which is truly the author giving an explanation to another character why this happened, why mm -hmm. didn't do this. You know, you saw this earlier, why didn't you do something about it then? It reminds me of the old old movies about uh, that don't make sense, uh, like the old horror pictures where they see the monster on the road and all the people in the car get out. Right, right. You know, why? so why... <laughs> Why, why? Why are you doing that? The is, 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 is the engine full, no longer working? You, have a full tank of you don't have right. reverse anymore, so it has to. <laughs> right. It has to make sense. But if it doesn't make sense, then try to explain that so that the set it does, so people are not really reading it and kind of mocking you later about you know this this didn't make sense at all. And would, and would you say <laughs> that that's sort of a byproduct of poor outlining? Or is there just, is it like creativity? Is it yeah, rushing through a story? I, I think it might be I think all of when the above. You get it, all of the above, but yeah. I think when you get into the rushing, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, especially when you get into the rushing, that's when it's going to show up. And then secondly, I think having a second pair of eyes mm -hmm. helps a lot where you can go back and mm -hmm. say, I, 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 uh, did you really mean to write that? I, right. I like what you said about the rushing right. because that's that's a problem with some, and I'll tell you why it's a problem. Because there's been a tradition in story writing of yes. writing pot boilers, right? And you write mm -hmm. them fast, and you right. get it out there so right. people can read. Right. And if you write one of those, you know, you can have some uh, continuity right. uh, issues. But you know, writing a good story is like making uh, a good gumbo. You'd have to take your time right. to make it right. Absolutely. You know, make sure that you have all the ingredients in, and, and that all there's the flavors to melt. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so you got to do that. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's kind of like who goes to the opera and starts the opera off at the crescendo. You know, I, you know, why do I want to start everything off in the middle? Uh, and I've got nowhere else to go now. You know. 
Uh, there's got to be a build up to it, you know. Uh, and just like you said with the gumbo, if you rush a meal, you rush a, mm-hmm. a dish, mm-hmm. it's not going to come out right. Now, folks, don't get this confused with uh, beginning a story, because you can begin a story right in the center of it. You know, for instance, you, I can if I start a story right now, I'll talk about there are five people inside of that bank and they've got hostages and we've got the place surrounded and a gunshot came and then all hell broke loose. So that's the beginning right, of a right. story. Yeah. You, you start it right yeah, out, right, you know, but right, right. OK. Uh, and, you know, what else you don't want to rush? Reading this book. <laughs> and if you want to pick up the book and, and trust what I mean. You can go to truthbooks.com, T-R-O-U-P-E, uh, and you can uh, meet the author page there. We'll take you to Ewing's Publishing House, or you can pick up a copy of Nicholas, How Nicholas Became Santa Claus. You can check out our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Troop Books, uh, T-R-O-U-P-E. Uh, if you have questions or comments for the show, please feel free to continue submitting your questions. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to answer you. We'd love to get in on this uh, on this chat. And hopefully next time we can have a conversation with the authors. 